great, great. So we're we're here to talk today, and and actually, the five of us have spoken about this before. Our continuous improvement journey at UC San Diego, because we get the, I think each of us gets asked this question a lot. How did this all start? And actually, last night at the opening reception, um, Mojkan and I saw pictures of the very first process Palooza. And we were sort of reflecting back that first year on how we were like, I think we're throwing a party and I'm not sure if anyone's going to (laughs) come, right? (laughs) But people showed up, people showed up. So um, we started this in 2017, um, way back, it seems a long time ago now, um, but we were doing a lot of other things. We didn't just throw the party. We'd been building a lot of other pieces and it sort of culminated in the party, right? So anyway, um, I wanted to start kind of there. At UC San Diego, we refer to the fact that we didn't hire consultants to bring up a lot of large-scale change for what we needed. Um, We relied on existing staff and faculty who were subject matter experts and empowered them to make change. So can you talk about like the cultural foundation of trust and empowerment and how it's helped your continuous improvement initiatives? And can you tell us a little bit about your continuous improvement initiatives? I can start, of course. Thank you. There is so much to say here. And if I had to rewind and go back in time and see like, where did this all come from? So I work in, as Aaron mentioned, the IT services department for UC San Diego. And at that time, around 2017, a little bit before, we had gone through a, what we call a reorganization of IT units across the university and merged many, a dozen units together. And so lots of different cultures, lots of ways of doing things, different staff came together and we needed a methodology or a method or standard way of approaching things and talking about things. So luckily um, at the same time, we brought in a brand new CIO and and some of you heard him speak, Vince Kellen today at the keynote. And um, he, he, with him came this uh, passion for standardization, efficiency, process improvement, and Lean Six Sigma was already identified on campus as a methodology of choice. So at IT services, we decided that everyone, every staff member, and at that time it was almost uh, 450 people, would go through Lean Six Sigma training, uh, Yellow Belt training, so that we can have a common understanding, a common way of approaching things. And I think that really set the groundwork for our culture at in our department. And with that, we work very closely with lots of other campus departments. So I think that kind of thought process and working on efficiency in order to bring technology that kind of matches that efficiency in, married up. So that was the very, very first step we took. That's perfect. And I know, Bob, um, as uh, the leader of OSI, that you played a part in that education, right? OSI played a part in that education. Can you tell us a little bit about that? So OSI, Operational Strategic Initiatives, uh, in 2014, if you were in here earlier, the chancellor mentioned the strategic plan. In 2014, as that rolled out, he asked OSI to at least be um, to get trained up on Lean Six Sigma and be his process ninjas. And so we went out and got trained up and we started training some other people at different levels in green belts and yellow belts. And we realized that we couldn't actually do all this training and also lead projects in the area. We couldn't scale ourselves in that way. So we started looking at how can we do this differently? And we looked at campus partners. We looked at uh, UC San Diego Extension and we worked with them to uh, kind of help frame up the Greenbelt program that in, that's changed and morphed and become amazingly better than what we imagined at the beginning. But they were our partners in that. And OSI then focused on actually leading Lean Six Sigma projects and leading training at the white belt and yellow belt level. And that and some of the people here maybe went through some of the sessions yesterday. And when you go back to the cultural component, I would say that What it did, you know, we were, I mean, as a university, we've always been trying to improve our processes. A lot of times, though, they might have been departmental, and a lot of those um, improvements maybe had a tail that didn't actually help 
another department. We heard Vince talk about flow. Uh, if you don't think of the end-to-end -end flow, you might actually be improving yours and hurting someone else. So really on our campus, we've, we've been doing a lot of process improvement. Not every improvement actually helped everyone. But what, what Lean Six Sigma has done is given us that common language, like Mojcon was talking about. It allows us to um, create safe spaces to have conversations that maybe we couldn't have before. And you can't really create culture unless you can actually communicate. And I think it's really helped us in that communication cycle. And, and maybe I could talk to, yeah, next, Tana, would you like to speak to, you're from the, a school, mm -hmm. your perspective. So you are, you had staff that were getting um, these concepts introduced to them, um, mm -hmm. this language introduced to them. How did your school adapt so I'm going to, um, I would say for Jacob's school, it's really a very much of a grassroots effort and goes back to my days in school of medicine before I came to engineering, uh, where there was a group of us that took Lean Six Sigma yellow belt training. And I think it was Cal State San Marcos. It was, it was probably like 2010 or so. And I really enjoyed that training. Um, there were some videos that were shared um, I think I tend to just automatically think in terms of how do you leverage technology, how do you become more efficient. So when I came to the engineering school, I already had that sort of base perspective and um, learning that we were going to grow as a school to be a pretty good size, but also recognizing we we might not get more staff in order to actually get the work done. Um, six departments all doing things in a different way. My thought was, why not go ahead and start to leverage and empower all the staff in the school who know what they need to get done and actually start to now um, teach them Lean Six Sigma. Let's make sure we ask why with everything that we do, which ended up becoming really a base premise. And then we just moved on from there. And I can talk more about this uh, administrative best practices initiative that I started in 2015. We really launched in 2016. It's now called APEX. And so you may see that acronym um, in the actual descriptor of our program, but I can certainly talk quite a bit more about that as we go on here. Perfect. Thank you, Tana. And so Ashley, health at the same time was kind of dipping their toe and, and getting ready for this transformation. Can you tell us a little bit about health, health sciences, healthcare system? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I actually um, I'm really excited to share what we've done there because I think just like campus over in our clinical enterprise for UCSD, we have big goals, right? We want to be top 10 for quality. We want to grow. We want to open clinics where people live and work, not just make everyone come into Hillcrest and La Jolla campuses. And we want to do this in a financially sustainable way. And we want to have best patient experience. And we really want to address the healthcare industry has a huge amount of burnout right now. So how do we do this? And it, it became really clear that uh, Lean Six Sigma was going to be the enabler that really um, shifted us from what we'd done in the past, which was outsource improvement to consultants for the most part, and um, really tap into the intelligence and the, you know, one of the core lean principles is respect for people. We have hired some of the most smart, intelligent, passionate people in in this city that delivering care from this the whole country really come here to to work here. How can we really empower them to make the changes, give them more control, feel less frustrated, have more transparency? And so for us, it was um, much more of a top down supported effort as opposed to the grassroots effort. And um, really focused on empowering uh, people to become problem solvers and really shifting the role of leadership to clear a path for that problem solving. Okay, so we've given everyone sort of laid the groundwork on the cultural foundation that we were trying to establish, right? So then can you talk to me a little bit about where each of your units went with that as we started to lay that foundation. Mojgan, how many things were we yes. doing? So many. <laughs> so many is right. And I think that's the key is to start planting all sorts of seeds and some of them will grow and some of them won't. And there'll be weeds that you have to pick. And that's, that's the whole idea that if I had to go back and think about what kind of got us to where we are, that was it. Like, oh, let's try that. Let's... So some of the things we did, um, what well, one thing was this process palooza. So we had 
training going on. At that time, I was going to, I would say there were hundreds of people. Now we have 7,000, but there were hundreds of people. We're like, wow, we have hundreds of people who have learned Lean Six Sigma. We have some major projects coming down the line. We have some interests in communities and that we can bring together. And and there was this one yellow belt class. Some of you may have gone yesterday and it was lots of excitement. What can we do to bring that home, to bring that to the university and improve university processes? And this was one thing, like, let's have a pollute process palooza. We call it something interesting, have some fun, make sure people come in and can roll up their sleeves and engage. So that was a seed that was planted. And we like maybe a couple hundred people will show up and we maxed out the first year and, and, and here we are. But that was one seed. The other uh, few things I just want to mention, some of the other seeds that have grown. <laughs> Lots of things happened at that 2017 time period. So one of the big initiatives on campus, uh, we call enterprise systems renewal. So our campus, as you may have noticed, it's growing, it's continued growing, leaps and bounds physically, enrollment numbers, healthcare, it's just growing. And in order to be able to sustain this growth, we have to, we can't just throw more people and more systems at it. How can we sustain? How can we meet this growth? And uh, one of the things was to renew our technologies, our backend technologies, but at the same time, look at our processes, our business processes, and make those efficient as we're bringing. So this enterprise system renewal looked at 30 large-scale uh, systems across the university. Think like your big payroll and HR and financial systems and so on and so forth. And with that... We looked around and we said, oh, we trained hundreds of Lean Six Sigma. Now we have thousands. And can we use the experts that we have in-house to come in and roll up their sleeves? So we launched something called Lean Bench. Lean Bench is looking for people who have gone through Lean Six Sigma and who have some time to contribute to a central effort like this renewal program. And come in, recruit those people. They keep their day job, but they come in and help and they become a neutral facilitator of lean assessment and re lean practices. And so we put together this lean bench concept and year over year, we recruited about uh, 20 or so every year of interested parties. And then we dispatched them to these large projects. And so the lean bench, business excellence, community practice, those are all seeds that were planted. So I'm going to, I'm going to stop there, but I would encourage you to try different things and see what sprouts. I love that. And that's that's absolutely what we were doing. And one of the other things that we did was um, offer a Lean Six Sigma scholarship. Um, and Bob, OSI was has always been um, a collaborator, partner, host of scholarship. Would you like to talk about that seed that we planted? So, yeah, so... Our Lean Six Sigma Greenbelt Scholarship Program is done in, in, in partnership with our extension. And what we do with that program is if you are interested, most of the people have gone through a yellow belt or a white belt, so they have some awareness of what it's about. But then they, they put in a proposal for a scholarship that we provide. Uh, they have to have a real project. They have to have a sponsor and their manager and their department. And then they go through the process with through the UC San Diego Extension pro, um, Greenbelt process. Uh, they don't learn to sing and dance, as far as I know, in the in the program. But that is, again, another addition that's a new innovation, I think, to the program. So we'll see. We're going to ask them to come back and actually dance their and sing and dance their results to us. But um, right now, they don't do that. They do a PowerPoint. But they come back, and each project they submit uh, is in a range of $50,000 in savings that, that is part of their project proposal for the green belt level and $100,000 uh, range for their black belt project that they propose. And those, we've had projects that have come back saving over millions of dollars. Uh, we've had some that have not quit the, hit the mark, but what they've done is they've given people, one, it's given the people that were doing the project the chance to try it and explore it in, in their own department with their own manager. The other thing that really have to look at is, does that manager understand it enough to be able to, like Pradeep said, get out of the way and let the process play out? And because a lot of times we rely on our gut and that gut doesn't necessarily take in all the data it really needs. So part of it is a, backward, a little backhanded way of uh, educating managers to how to be successful in having lean in your own department. 
I, I think that that goes along with some of the perception that's out there around lean that you always have to look at as you grow a program. Uh, we were very purposeful on the main campus to not use uh, terminology that sounded too corporate and too business. So we really pulled that out of the vernacular. So uh, we used terms that people were used to and tried to scale using those. And now we use a lot more of the, of the corporate type of terms more easily with people. But there wasn't that trust and people would kind of associated lean with uh, uh, efficiency programs that you'd see in the corporate world, which would be, result in job loss. So we really had to educate people that this is not that. This is giving you the power to change your day-to-day -day job and improve an entire stream of workflow all the way out to the people you serve across campus. So that, I mean, it was part of the, the educational and growth that we really focused on some of those um, soft sides of the equation to make sure that it would be successful. That's perfect. So, so then Tanit, now we're, we're getting people trained and we're talking about getting out of their way, empowering mm -hmm. employees. And sometimes it's really difficult for employees to feel, to pre create a safe space so that they feel like they can bring up a problem, mm -hmm. an issue, and then ask them for solutions. So can you tell us about J uh, Jacob's engine? engineering, School of Engineering's journey with sure. making that safe space? Sure. So, um, you know, going back to sort of this grassroots effort and introducing and planting seeds um, was an all-hand staff meeting in the school where I introduced the concept of Lane Six Sigma and the concept of you want to ask why, you know, you're empowered to actually change the way you do your work in a way that is going to help you tremendously um, connect you with your colleagues because departments are really very siloed at that time in the school. And I think that's true probably across campus that, you know, that's your environment, that's your culture, but let's, let's reach across departments and talk to each other. And so what we did was form these committees that were focused on certain areas. So academic personnel, human resources, facilities, and, and a few others and brought together subject matter experts, one from each department uh, as well as we had one MSO, also now I think they really call themselves chief administrative officers, CAOs, who were all part of the structures. We had an executive committee, they were members, but we had an MSO join and facilitate, not run, because we wanted it to be run by the staff. They were to facilitate in an area that they were not experts, right? So somebody who was maybe a student affairs is where they really focused, but go ahead and become the facilitator for finance because you're gonna ask more questions yourself and help really encourage the group to talk about it. Um, we also hired somebody who's a black belt, uh, Lean Six Sigma black belt, Sean Monroe, who is now part of uh, the campus and he's he's um, participating in Process Palooza, eventually replaced by Kate Balderston, who is, is in the audience today. And we um, then, had them meet and take an inventory of all the processes that each of those groups worked on. And ultimately between those, there were five groups in the beginning, there were 200 processes that they identified. But when you count six departments, one Dean's office and Qualcomm Institute was part of this effort as well, that led to 1600 unique processes. Um, and so the goal was then, now let's start talking about your pain points. And it was fully empowering all the staff on the committee they're the ones who talked about what is, where are some of the biggest issues that I have, um, and then come up with some recommended solutions. And all of this was going through the standard, you know, process mapping and then discovering what those issues are. Let's look at the swim lanes before and after. And they came up with some really great recommendations, many of which we implemented. Um, and I, I think it was really quite empowering for all of them. Uh, and then that was all pre-ESR. So then things were were really shifting um, as ESR came along. Yeah, that's incredible. Incredible what you built over there. Um, Ashley, I wanted to turn to you because you came from campus and, and moved over to health during that time. What did you, how did you approach your work at health? You had quite a bit. Well, all the success on campus, I think is actually what opened the door to health being open to this. And I will say there was initially a lot of resistance. Um, people are very busy. They know how to do their jobs. You know, we don't need this too. And so we started by piloting in our outpatient area. 
because we had a senior leader that was a champion and very open to it, had worked somewhere else, had seen it work. And so we had kind of an open door there. And um, in the first year, demonstrated enough value that the pull coming from the inpatient side was more than we could handle. So I think we kind of took a show me approach. And what happened after that was um, essentially trying to very systematically build shared language, shared methods. Our CEO um, pays for anyone to attend training. And so we partnered with UCSD Extension. We had developed a healthcare-focused version. All the examples were healthcare. All the principles are the same, uh, but making it feel really meaningful uh, to people who work in healthcare. And we partnered with Extension. And um, in the last four and a half years, we've trained over 3,000 people, which I can't believe. Um, That's over 30% of our workforce. And when you have that many people with a common language, common lens, Um, We also started doing a monthly report out of process improvement work. And so we celebrate improvement work that's happened in the organization. And we actually build in accountability report outs, a little five-minute slot on, okay, it's been six months. Have we sustained the improvement? What lessons have we learned? And so there's also a really big best practice sharing, kind of build that community culture. And, um, you know, our team, I I mentioned earlier, we used to outsource to consultants all the time. I think our team has really... um, taken on a lot of that consulting work internally, really using methodology. We implemented a week-long improvement event called a rapid process improvement workshop that has really revolutionized um, because we bring stakeholders from all along the value stream together. And we basically sequester for a week. We look, you know, there's a lot of current state measurement that happens going into it, but similar to process Palooza method, uh, we spend a week um, PDSAing and figuring out what's going to work. And we walk away with a clear action plan. And and those are all high priority in the organization for support. And so I think it's just really been being consistent in the methods, having, trying to engage as many people as possible. The the third piece is the daily engagement system. Uh, If you look it up on internet, it's usually called a daily management system, but for us, it was all about engagement. So we called it the daily engagement system. And this is a tiered huddling system. It started with just local teams huddling, but at this point, uh, every single day, over 80% of the organization has a 15 minute, some of, some of them are shorter, um, quick check-in where they escalate any issues. They look at alignment uh, to institutional strategy. So what are we doing to contribute to our organizational goals and improvement? What ideas do we have to improve? and problem solving as a team. And anything that can't be handled locally gets escalated to the manager, then to the director's huddle, then to the chief administrative officer's huddles, then all the way to the CEO by 1030. If there's anything that needs to be escalated in the organization, it's eliminated so many meetings, so many emails. And I'd say that has been, uh, honestly, was a side effect of COVID. Uh, We replaced our command center with the system and it's, I don't think anyone would go back. Yeah, it's become part of our heartbeat. Yeah, that's incredible. I love the daily engagement system. I've, I've witnessed it. It's really incredible what you've set up there. And I think it's speaking to the agility. So um, I love our theme here, build, unbuild, rebuild. And um, at this point, I, I want to share, I have a confession. I have a real pet peeve with this saying that some people use. We're building the plane as we fly it. How many people have heard of that? We're building the plane as we fly. Who's getting on that plane, right? Nobody's getting on that. I'm not getting on that plane if you're building it as you fly it. So I think I love when I hear what everybody on the panel has been talking about, where it's being responsive. It's not about building the plane as you fly it. It's about being agile, being able to change. And I think that agility set us up for the past couple of years and how we've responded. So past couple of years have uh, put forth for everyone, many industries, um, incredible, unprecedented challenges. How were we as an institution and each of you in each of your areas able to respond? And how does agility play into that? I'm going to start with Bob, because I know we've talked about this a lot. So um, I think you're referring to this thing called COVID, right? Yeah, so um, I I think the, the the infrastructure and the common language we created 
you know, through the years leading up to COVID, really, really is what set us up for, I can't call it success, but I think it is success in how we managed our, our methods and approaches into COVID. Um, we all remember March of 2020 with not very good memories. Uh, in April, uh, our team was asked if we could work with infectious disease and some modelers about, well, what if we could test at a certain frequency? We're like, whoa, and how could we do this? And so um, quickly, we brought together a team of people that were crossed over IT on campus, IT in the health system, student health, logistics, all the different groups in our campus. I mean, I left some out, I'm sure, I'm sorry about that. We brought everyone together really quickly. Uh, we said, in two weeks, could we get a pilot up of a system where you could do self-administered PCR level testing? And, and people are like, what is that even? We don't even know what it is. Because this is April of 2020, right? And so we used our, uh, you've heard some today earlier, some different things come out from the different speakers, but we used a little bit of design thinking and empathy for the person on the far end. We used IT was going agile, creating iterations of everything that was being talked about each meeting. Uh, we had Lean Six Sigma measuring everything that was done that we would even remotely try to roll out. And we had, you know, you name all the disciplines you could, we brought them all together kind of in this mashup with, uh, we set a common goal that helped be the overarching theme for everything with the, uh, the, uh, uh, the health, and safe, health and wellness of the campus. And that would be our overarching goal to achieve. And by bringing that all together, one, we had this level of trust. All of us came together, not knowing what the heck we were doing, but we knew that we could trust each other to bring ideas, to share things, to fail, I say fail faster, so we could get to what we needed to, which was what we felt self-administered testing that we could do at scale for the PCR test. So lo and behold, two weeks later, IT had an app that could scan a barcode on a tube that someone had self-administered swab. It would go over to our Calm Lab over in the health system. It would get run through the system there and the result would show up in their, their Epic um, health charts. So that to me is a really beautiful example of what building this culture of, yes, we can do it. And this trust amongst all these groups, I mean, there were no silos. And I think that was really a perfect example of uh, how lean and these other dialogues can really drive and create a new culture. So, I mean, the high level really quick. Bob, I was thinking about that. There weren't any silos. Unlike the culture, we see a lot in higher education. Higher education loves a committee, right? <laughs> but we were putting together groups that um, were unconventional compared to higher education standards. Um, and Bojgan, one of my favorite stories was you were working with yeah. one of Bob's return to learn teams. I'm totally multiple. putting, yes, multiple. multiple. And I'm putting you on the spot because I love that story of the nurses who at first were on library walk and were asking students if they, if they wanted to test for their own health and safety. Can you walk us through? Oh, sure, absolutely. It was really day by day, things were developing, multiple things. So it was uh, being there, boots on the ground and hearing and sensing what people were going through. There was a lot of anxiety out there. So our push was to get people, get the students tested, get everybody tested. And it was, um, you know, it was about their own safety. And when we walked around and, and people, you know, some people were showing up, some people weren't, the numbers were okay. We were counting, we were sitting there with stopwatches and seeing when people sneezed and what, what caused people to sneeze and tick marks. But uh, what happened was we, uh, one of the nurses out there decided to approach some of the students and ask them like, what, what is, and they're like, we just want to get back to school. Like we want things to be back to normal. And so that was the angle is that we want to create the environment that allows everybody to come back, that allows the students and, and their, um, you know, friends to come back. And that was the angle that actually resonated. And they started telling each other. And, the, and so quickly, the next day, we changed the signs <laughs> to promote that. And, and, and that, was, that was really interesting. It was just just in time changes, everybody on board. Absolutely. I love that. I love that story. I mean, within the, you know, I would speak to other institutions that were still talking about masking, you know, six months later, eight months later, we were way far ahead because we were responding within hours. And, and Ashley Health was such a huge partner with all of that work. Can you tell us what was happening in health at that time? 
so much was happening in health at that time. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the daily engagement system replacing our command center. So we had a command center um, set up, which is what we typically do, put a bunch of us in a conference room together and then have basically any pathway for communication in. And then it's almost like air traffic control to, you know, like we had to get our call center fully virtual in two weeks. Um, we had to, I mean, there were so many things we had to adjust, but I think having the communication pathways and kind of taking the guesswork out of, do you have this person's phone number and who do I call for that? Just making it just simple, any escalation come in through this pathway and handled this way. And then eventually replaced through the daily huddles, which was even more efficient. Um, the other thing I think, um, uh, is really core is this PDSA mindset. Right. And so we have, I think an academic institution, this is really natural for us. You don't have to go to a whole day of lean training to understand PDSA because it's really just scientific method. I have a hypothesis. Here's how I'm going to test it. How did it go? What do I want to adjust based on what I learned? And I think this PDSA mindset is probably the, the tool and, and the, the method to be agile, right? Let's not worry about having a perfect solution. Let's just see if this works. Let's, let's reflect on that tomorrow. Let's adjust and let's kind of continuously improve till we get there. Instead of like you said, committee work where we have this perfectly fully thought out solution. It's just like little steps in the right direction. And I think that helped every little thing. Uh, in December of 2020, uh, we found out that we had three weeks to stand up the Petco superstation, vaccine superstation, <laughs> three weeks. And it was like, let's call Raphael's party rentals and get some tents. Uh, let's see, you know, which businesses are going to be impacted if we have, you know, lines of cars going through the city streets. So it was like, everyone had to come together, but we actually took a very lean approach to design the process. And then our team, Brian, Lily, sitting right here, um, you know, we, we went down there, we were tick marks saying how long it took a car to get from entering the lot to checking in, to getting their shot. You know, how many times was a car breaking down and stopping flow? Um, so we use these tools to optimize flow. And then everything we learned from that, we applied before we even opened Remac and uh, took a walk-up model to the same thing. And it was just like these rapid improvement cycles is all that it was. And good communication, I'd say, is those two things. Right. Which, which I love, right? Unbi it's build, unbuild, rebuild again and, and again and again, very quickly. <laughs> so, so, Tana, tell us from a campus perspective, how were your staff feeling? How were they responding? Mm -hmm. So I would say that the culture that we had built for probably about five years at that point, um, four or five years, was one of trust and partnership. And we're all in this together. Silos had been broken down. We were openly communicating, I thought, better than ever before with the dean's office and the school um, departments. When COVID came along, you know, there was such a, an immediate shift. Everybody had to shift overnight, you know, and really uh, learn what is Zoom all about and such. Um, I would say that in the school, we also were regular users of Google Chat, and we also used Slack quite a bit, sometimes Teams. Well, those became even more important as we moved to COVID and things were changing so rapidly just with the education piece, the research piece that um, myself and our school business officer, Lisa Roussan, we met with the chief administrative officers in our department every single day via Zoom, every day. Things were changing so often, it was sometimes by the hour. And I think we had that trust and that partnership that everyone banded together and trusted each other. And we worked our way through it day by day together. So that was really critical. And then of course they're working with their teams in their departments. Um, then not too long after I'll, I'll now add ESR into the equation, which wasn't too many months after COVID. Um, and that also was a time of course of, uh, there's a lot of transition. And I, I really do love the theme, you know, build, unbuild, rebuild. I think that describes Apex perfectly. Um, you know, building, ESR came along. Now it's sort of an unbuild and we're rebuilding. And so we shifted as a school as a, and as an administration where we shifted more to Apex became about ESR change management. And how are we going to make sure that we can work together to move forward as these new systems are rolled out 
and people are figuring out how to handle things. And so I think that that our APEX initiative really allowed for the subject matter experts and all the other staff in spe specific areas, you know, HR, for example, with UC Path, to quickly band together and lean on each other to, to move forward and implement the systems the way they needed to. And also, I think that we were really instrumental as an administrative group in working with the campus and partnering around solutions, because it was a lot of change very quickly. Um, we, Kevin Chow, for example, a number of us met with him, I'd say every week at a certain point. We had a lot of subject matter experts from around the school that served on really critical committees in all sorts of areas to help move things forward and make sure that uh, we were filling any gaps or, or other things that may have come up. And so I really think it was pretty essential. And I believe that we've contributed quite a bit towards all of the efforts here to now rebuild. That's great. Um, and Tani, you mentioned organizational change management or change management. We do use ProSci change management on campus as one of our additional uh, toolkits. Other takeaways, other quick takeaways that if someone was visiting from another institution, you would say, try this. I love, Mojkan, your thing about plant some seeds and just see what takes. What, what other takeaways or tools would you highlight? Yes, I would say, and I think everybody here mentioned it, it, it is take small actions. Take actions where it's right next to you. The things we're talking about are larger outcomes that have grown over years and uh, you know the right things came together but i would say uh, if you're starting and you don't have a lot of the other opportunities or infrastructure start small show the value you know visualize putting it out there you know mapping something out it kind of speaks for itself so i would say that and the other thing i would mention is um, bob kind of touched on this Discipline leads to freedom. So if you set the structure up, set a structure up that you can fall back on and kind of reuse that when it comes time to, I think that'll come in handy. Great. Bob, would you like to? I'll just add one, one thing. You know, you have all the tools we keep talking about, use the data, drive the data, data drives everything behind you know, what we are doing. At the same time, as you're starting out, I mean, you were still working, kind of balancing out what your gut's telling you. And and the one thing I always kind of think is the good gut instinct is if if you're working on something in your department and you're improving that process and you think about what would be the impact outside of my department, think of the whole stream, the whole flow. And if you start thinking about the whole flow, you might say, oh, wow, we'll have a negative impact on them. Well, then maybe it's time to start thinking about taking in some more data and start going down that step. If it's going to impact nobody else, maybe it's a little different, but like Moshkan was saying, you can take those actions and test it in your own department. If it's not going to impact anybody outside those walls, that's great. Just kind of iterate and and, and kind of rewash it and go again in, in that. But if it's going to have a negative impact outside, that's the time to really think. start thinking about bringing in that group that's going to be impacted. Start maybe using some tools and testing that way. Great, Tana. Sure. So um, I'll add um, that we planting the seeds, I know, which Mojgan just mentioned is really important, introducing, introducing the concept of process improvement through uh, Lean Six Sigma training. Um, I forgot to mention that we did have all the staff go through yellow belt training. That was really critical. We had a team come, come in from UC Riverside that had um, really were pretty advanced in their use of Lean Six Sigma, so helped with examples and just talking through. Um, and then really it's back to this way we set up our structure is empowering people to vocalize where they're experiencing the most challenges. And it was also looking at data at the same time. So it's not just, we're just going to talk about it. It's It needs to be documented. It needs to be really understood that these are pain points that are experienced by others as well because we want to, we have limited time. We want to make sure we focus on the biggest issues. Um, and then I also want to just mention that as we move forward as an initiative, we always uh, reached out to relevant offices on campus. And I'll use facilities management as an example. Kirk Bellis joined our facilities meetings for years. So when Tririga came along, we ended up actually being very involved in helping inform to build that system and what was needed and how it worked within a school. 
Um, and then we eventually had School of Physical Sciences join our best practices initiative, especially with ESR and we're all out there on Zoom and you know what, what better way to bring people together um, and eliminate more silos and then eventually the School of Biological Sciences. And now we're fortunate to see the effort move to the center of excellence. So we have a much broader best practices initiative that we're gonna, I think, be able to make even greater progress. Great, Ashley. And our last from health, yeah, yeah. I I think you know I mentioned we train so many people, and a lot of times you get a yellow belt or a green belt, and you have this great toolkit, and you're like, okay, I can go analyze the current state, I can understand root causes, maybe even facilitate a kaizen, bring people into that, and then we have our countermeasures, and we have our sustainability plan. And there's all these tools, right? You can make a great fishbone diagram and you can do a great analysis, but then you're like, I'm struggling with facilitating other people through this. Maybe not everyone's been through the training. Maybe not everyone val values this or, or even the approach. And I think this is where kind of marrying up, it's more than tools, right? There's mindsets and behaviors on the process improvement side. And then you mentioned change management and I love the ad car. Um, to make it simpler, we've kind of created a version of that. We just call it the hearts and minds. So I can tell you all day long and there's things you need to be told, right? You need to be told, oh, we're making this change or here's the data or here's training on how to do it differently. But if, if you don't attend to the heart that someone's having to let go of doing something the way they know how to do it, even if they want to change, they still have to let go. Um, and understanding that the there's so much change going on. This may be your top priority. It may not be theirs, you know? And so I think just kind of this hearts and minds approach, I think is really, really important and enabling this to happen well. I love that. Um, I am getting a few questions from our virtual participants and I want to hit them really quickly. We only have a couple minutes left. Mojgan, this question's for you. How much time was expected to be spent on a big project for Lean Bench? while continuing in the person's day job? Uh, the minimum we required was 20% of their uh, full-time job. So that would be minimum. And then we would backfill so that their home department could kind of leverage the backfill um, funds for other things. Perfect. Bob, this question's coming in for you. Any recommendations for the transformation if the norm from executive management we have today defaults to consultants versus empowering our existing teams? I think that's like the number one question we get. How do we sell this to leadership? That's well, the number I, one question we get. I, again, I think you've heard some of it here. You, you can start in a department or an area. You can show that success. And then people, you know, you will have other leaders ask, what, how did you do that? How did you figure that out? And they start to hear that conversation and that dialogue, and it can it can flow up from that wherever the grassroots starts. Um, it helps if you have a leader somewhere. Like in, in our case, we had multiple leaders, but our chancellor was interested. He didn't know exactly where he wanted it to go. You heard that this morning. If you heard him, he goes, "I didn't know it would become this big and it would become this impactful." But or you, we have our our CIO and Vince. Um, that was a great mix or an opportunity of of uh, skills being developed and tools being put in place and a person that came in. So you don't know when those crossover points are going to hit, but uh, the, you know, it's kind of um, what is luck. It's like, is where preparation meets the opportunity, right? So, you know, if you get yourself ready and you prove it out in various areas, I think you can actually then uh, find the right sponsors and the right people to showcase it. That's perfect. Thank you, Bob. And then the next question I'm going to give to Tana and Ashley, um, what are the long-term plans for maintaining lean culture at UCSD when the, uh, oh, I, yes, for uh, when the current leadership will move on? Is there a method of transference? Tana, you're co-chair of our best practices group. Mm -hmm. And Ashley, I would love for you to bring that back to hearts and minds too. So thoughts? Um, well, so I think it, exactly as you just said, Erin, we have a best practices group now that is all the assistant deans in academic affairs. And um, Marie Carter Dubois and myself co chair. Erin is incredibly uh, involved. Kate Balderston now attends, who has moved to a role under EBC's office. So we have the, a training center pilot that's underway that is going to involve a lot of SME participation in putting together the training. Um, there's a lot of other initiatives that we are looking at. We want to, again, work together in order to solve some of the challenges 
um, leverage technology. We have a couple of really great application development teams in a couple of the schools um, because we do anticipate, you know, I could just, for those of you that know what GCCP means, but, you know, it's a tool that is going to help, I think, staff not only in academic affairs, but also across the campus um, to not have to rework to leverage technology, um, utilize activity data hubs, which are fantastic. I mean, to have these activity hubs that we can pull data into dashboards, whether it be Cognos, Tableau, um, we can also have some live introduction of data into that, to that mix and uh, make sure that we're not duplicating data entry. I mean, and so these are all topics that are discussed um, between our best practices group, which again is a very broad group. And then I think expanding that even more so across campus will be fantastic. Great. And Ashley, perfect wrap. Talk to yeah, us. I mean, it's our identity, right? So it's not about a leader. Um, you know, we've tried to train so many people that it becomes our language. We've really adjusted the language to be kind of just language you can use all the time. Um, we don't call it Lean Six Sigma. We call it transformational healthcare, and that's not going away. Uh, I think the other thing that um, this coming year we're going to be like full court press on is kind of um, supporting that middle management layer in the organization, because I think, you know, if our executive team turns over, um, having kind of those mindsets and behaviors at that middle management level, huh, I'm noticing this problem coming up every week. Maybe we should get to a root cause so we're not solving that same problem every time. Oh, my team members uh, are frustrated with something. How could I have, uh, as their leader, how can I coach them to come up with some solutions and empower them and support them as opposed to just putting that on my shoulders and solving everyone's problems for them, right? And so if we can really work on um, reinforcing and building out that middle management layer, I think it's going to have probably very long standing impact. Wonderful. Well, big round of applause, please. Thank you to our panelists, Bob, Tana, Ashley, Mojkan for sharing their journeys. Um, we are getting some more questions about how can I learn more about, and I think any, yes, all, all, all of our panelists, you can reach out to them directly, reach out to myself. Thanks so much and um, have a wonderful day at Palooza.